Welcome to another wonderful customer Power BI session at the Microsoft Business Application Summit. My name is Lauren Faber and I sit on the Power BI customer advisory team and I'm super excited to have Banfield Pet Hospital with us today and we have Kelsey and Rebecca from the company. Today they will be sharing a little bit about their user-centric BI customer success story um, and if we could get started by having Rebecca tell us a little bit more about your roles and about the company. Sure, thanks for that introduction, Lauren. We're from Banfield Pet Hospital. We are one of the largest veterinary healthcare companies in the country. We mostly serve preventive care to cats and dogs. Um, our company is owned by Mars Inc., which is the candy company. Mars initially got involved in pet care through pet food and then has since expanded into veterinary care. Hi, I'm Kelsey Wiggin. I'm the manager of the operational reporting and insights team, and we manage reporting for our hospitals and field management. So that amounts to about 3000 users. We also work with insights for our operations and finance departments at our central headquarters. And I have a passion for user centric BI, which I'll be talking about today. Uh, I also want to call out that we've had grassroots growth of Power BI at the company, and I was one of the early analysts working with it. Uh, we actually started with just a handful of free desktop downloads a few years ago, and we've moved to multiple premium nodes and a few hundred pro licenses. It has been a really cool journey. And I'm Rebecca McCarthy, the interim manager for our data and analytics team in our IT department. Um, and we, which the, the team largely consists of our data warehouse team as well as data strategy. And my passion really lies in building strong collaborative relationships between our business stakeholders and technical teams. Collaboration is a theme you'll hear throughout the presentation as Kelsey discusses her team's user-centric approach to BI. And it's important to also note the strong collaboration required between technical and business teams. Um, our teams together really partnered closely in this overall Power BI administration and governance to make for successful implementation. More about our company. We have roughly 1,100 hospitals across the country and see more than 9 million pet visits annually. We employ close to 20,000 associates across the company with more than three and a half thousand of those being veterinarians. The company is dominated by females and millennials. With all those pets we serve, we bring in close to 9 million records nightly from our hospital servers, holding about 11 terabytes of that raw medical data. And we use a lot of that data on a regular basis for analytics, as you can see from the 120,000 daily sessions we have against our database. And this amount of data really allows us to lead the industry forward using our data for research and providing publications and insights to the rest of the veterinary care industry. Perfect, thank you so much for those introductions. So I know that Power BI at your company was established in a very grassroots way. What does the future of analytics look like for you? So analytics at Banfield, we have a lot of different types of data users across our company. So we might have some report builders who are a little lower tech, might not know coding languages, and we really, they rely more on that um, plug and play uh, BI tools to get the data that they need um, for insights. And then we have a pretty large group of analysts across the business. Many of the teams have their own um, team of analysts. And they might use those plug and play tools, but also um, get a lot of insights from our groomed and organized data that um, they can query the database for. And then we also have data scientists. So we have a lead data scientist and also a few other um, analysts in the company or who are, are taking their career path a little more in that data science direction. And they're really using machine learning and algorithms to, you know, predict future um, outcomes and gain more insight to drive our business. And they might be utilizing some of that groomed and organized data, but also utilizing more of that real-time data capture that sits in, our, in a data lake in the cloud storage. Um, we don't necessarily have our own cloud storage on our tenant just yet, but we do share data storage with our parent and sister companies. Regardless of where that data is coming from, that data can be utilized in Power BI. And it's partner that partnership between our business teams and our IT data team that really 
makes this all come to life. Our, our data warehouse developers are making that data available. And then on the data team is also our Power BI administrator and another um, data systems analyst. So that group all working together is really what is driving our business forward with getting all of these insights from the data that we store. And I know that so far you've had a lot of success by focusing on the needs of the users in building these reports. And I'm excited to hear more about how you've been able to accomplish that. Kelsey, I know you've prepared some great material. Could we go through some of that now? Yes, so I'm going to dive into what it takes to build a user-centric BI tool. Um, and user-centric BI is about building a system that prioritizes the user's benefit and experience. Uh, and I'm going to go through these five different uh, pillars or considerations. Uh, one thing I want to note before we head in is the project that we did recently was to roll out structured reporting to our field, including our hospital associates, leaders, and regional management. That's about 18,000 possible users, probably about 3,000 active users. Um, so it is on a pretty large scale. So just keep that in mind with the examples that I'm giving. So the first is to find the right people for requirements. And the thing to consider here is that, from my perspective, you need commitment um, for an extended time frame from these folks. Uh, so you want them involved in your requirements and testing process. Um, of course, it depends on the scale of your project, but that could be uh, weeks or months. So the first thing to do is to define user personas. Um, so at our company, we have two sides of management, the operations and the medical side. Um, our reporting focuses on operations. That's what our team focuses on. Um, but medical is so interrelated that we need to make sure to have representation and define those user personas separately between operations and medical. And we also had the different uh, layers of management and we considered that as well. And the next would be to cast a wide net initially. So we probably started with about 60 folks for requirements, having some initial sessions and conversations. And that was it gave us the sense of who was interested and up for the commitment in the longer term. So the next step we took was to pare down that group. Um, so from my perspective, you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen when you're doing requirements gathering, or you'll have too much negotia negotiation on your plate as people tend to want different things. Uh, so some things to keep in mind is to try to make this group representative of the whole of your users. While it can be really helpful to have a couple of rock stars, um, you might want some performers uh, that better represent the whole group as well. Um, also people I mentioned who are up for that time commitment and people who will work independently too, especially when it comes to user testing. Um, you'll want them to start using the reporting as if it were a part of their job uh, pretty early on in the process. And the final consideration is to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations. Uh, so while it might be easier to have the group requirement sessions, uh, and that's how we started off. I actually had a couple people who missed requirements meetings and I followed up with some one-on-one -on -one conversations. And during one of those, uh, one woman set, provided her perspective that we were headed in the wrong direction with the, the kind of what we've been drafting um, and that it would be too cumbersome for the field to use. And we ended up changing our entire direction for one of our initial kind of heavy hitter reports because of that conversation. And I'm not sure that she would have felt comfortable saying that sort of thing um, with a bigger group. So going forward, we made sure to kind of pick up on some of those individual conversations to get that sort of feedback. Yeah, I think those one-on-one -on -one discussions are super key because I know coming from someone who might not feel as comfortable speaking up in a group or not wanting to feel like I'm dominating the conversation when I'm one on one with someone, I can express more of those concerns and without fear of any of that group mentality. So I think those discussions are super valuable. Yep, that's exactly it. So moving on to the next consideration is to interview to understand the business as a part of your requirements gathering. Um, I think our instinct going into conversations about reporting is to ask for what users want to see. Uh, but what I found is that requests will likely be similar to what they've had in the past. Uh, they might need, not meet good visualization practice, that sort of thing. Uh, in our case, our prior reporting was a static data table with hundreds of numbers and dozens of pages, a version of which had been around for a really long time. And we knew that Power BI could provide so much more than that. We knew that the business had modernized. Uh, and so we didn't ask them what they wanted to see. 
something that can be really helpful is to demonstrate the possibilities, especially if this is a new tool for them uh, and maybe their mindset is around static reporting or something like that. And just kind of to open up their minds around, you know, what the future could look like around reporting. It just might help your, your requirements conversations. And then the last couple of things is when you are having these conversations, really seek to understand the business and dive into the pain points. Uh, instead of talking about what you want to see, talk about how your business functions, uh, where you struggle, you know, what's that day to day look like for you and how do you, how can you leverage data as a part of that process? An example that we have is that we had previously one of our reports just looked like another big data table, um, by day of the week. And it wasn't very clear to us as analysts and developers. Um, how that was being leveraged. But when we dug into the conversation around the business case, we helped understand that primarily it was around creating a balance between when associates were working and when clients wanted to come in and get different services, uh, primarily between weekdays and weekends. And once we understood that business case, we were able to develop visualizations that could help highlight where maybe there were some imbalances or raise exceptions where those cases were happening as well. So now as we're moving into development, um, I'd recommend that you negotiate and iterate uh, to maintain your users as the focus. Uh, something that can be really helpful is to find a balance of innovation and familiarity. I think if you go too far down the path of innovation, it can be hard to get people on board and using the new tool. Uh, so trying to find that balance. Uh, when you are, working on the innovation piece of it, some things that you can do are try out new visuals, um, leverage a new data source that maybe you haven't had in reporting before, uh, but make sure to review with your users for pros and cons to understand if it's something that they can wrap their head around and adopt in the longer term. So that's something I think is super important is to maintain focus and not provide everything that everyone's asking for. Um, so I think it's really important to prioritize and negotiate. So I mean, you get a list of the things that everyone's asking for, uh, to kind of find where there's commonalities and where it's just some personal preference stuff. It might not make sense to include that in the kind of group reporting. Um, and that's an opportunity that you could leverage self-service uh, for those personal preferences. So as you continue down the development road, another thing to keep in mind is to focus on usability. Uh, from my perspective, make your applications user friendly instead of focusing on training people to use them. Um, so if it's user friendly, then they can pick it up easily. Uh, they won't need to read or watch or you know, take their time for um, training and documentation. Um, it helps to deal with turnover when you have new associates coming in and picking up the tool and maybe it wasn't that big push of training at the beginning, uh, that sort of thing. So I think that's super important. And one way to focus on usability is to seek out feedback, uh, both when you're going through the user testing process, but then also after you've released an application, you can always make updates to it. Uh, I think it's hard for us as developers and managers to understand the pain points when we're, we've been working with this tool for a while, we might be a bit more tech savvy, that sort of thing. Um, so one thing that we did is we surveyed our users after an initial release it wasn't our larger release, so we had a smaller scale of users. Um, and we got some surprising feedback. So we heard that navigation was really where they were struggling. They were finding like little pop-ups were happening and uh, we had some overlapping visuals so they couldn't get to that drill up, drill down feature, uh, that sort of thing. So that was something we really focused on. We did a refresh of the reporting ahead of our bigger release um, to try to improve the usability of the application. And all of this is really meant to improve adoption. If you have an easy to use application, uh, just more people will be likely to use it. Yeah, I like the example that that you gave of uh, getting that feedback throughout the process rather than just at the beginning or at the end that you're continually getting it so that you could change and adapt the report as you were building it based on the user feedback. For sure, get feedback as much and as often as you can. So the final point to make is don't let adoption be an option. So make it irresistible and give them something that they can't live without. A few examples, and we've leveraged these, are to make your data refresh more frequently than it has in the past. 
Um, so we went from weekly refreshes to daily refreshes, for example. Another thing that you can do is to give them a new data source uh, that will give them some new business insights that they haven't had previously. Uh, and another thing you could try is to um, provide them metrics that tie to their pay or bonuses, uh, because that makes it uh, very enticing for people to check out the reporting. And one thing we find is that if it uh, becomes routine to go into the application because they're very interested in one thing or another, they'll explore it as they go in there and they'll find more value over time. Thanks, Kelsey, for all of those tips. Um, would we actually be able to see any of the reports that you have been able to create based off of this process? Yeah, so we have a few screenshots that we can take a look at with some anonymized data. And this is actually our rewrite of one of our the standard reports that was previously a big, um, big old data table. And I'm going to talk about how we've applied some of those user centric con concepts um, to this reporting. So I mentioned during that requirements gathering session, really diving into the business need and pain points and things like that. Um, that was not obvious from the previous reporting, that big data table, um, but from having those conversations, we heard how important it was for the teams to be able to celebrate wins from the prior week to start off the week. Um, and so that was something we decided to build a dashboard as a landing page and, um, and focus on wins. Uh, so you can see in the bottom left-hand corner here, we talked about things like best evers, uh, that they can celebrate. We have a revenue streak, so how many weeks in a row they've beat their revenue target. Another thing to celebrate and motivate people. Uh, and we also look at some rankings where people can both pick out those wins and also find some areas of opportunity as well. In the bottom right-hand corner, uh, we heard there was a lot of interest in talking about forward-looking and what you need to do to meet targets looking forward. Um, so we focused on that here looking at month to date um, and what the results are looking like. And if you're down on your revenue target, how you some different ways that you could make up um, that miss. So another thing that I talked about as a part of the process is to negotiate. And I talked about finding that balance of innovation and familiarity. So this dashboard looks a lot different from the reporting that we used to have, but we did pair the dashboard with a data table um, where managers could do things like see hospitals side by side. Um, I have uh, the numbers in here blurred out, but you can see the kind of foundation with the hospitals on the left hand side, some metrics. Um, and with this, our goal was to add some focus. It looks like a lot going on, but actually we pared this down to about half the metrics that were in the previous data table. So that was a big win. And then we just added a lot of flexibility for users who wanted to slice and dice differently. Um, so we provided some filters where they can uh, filter things down. They have drill up and drill down to different levels of the org hierarchy or time hierarchy. Um, they can look at this year or last year or targets or comparisons to either um, and that sort of thing. So flexibility was key there. From a usability perspective, uh, we wanted to provide, as I said, we gathered feedback throughout the process. Um, and a few things we did to make it more usable was we used slicers instead of the filter pane. So it was just more obvious to our users how to filter in the application. Um, you can also see we use this uh, bright blue color for anything that was a button in the application so that users knew it was interactive. Um, even on our drill up and drill down, you can see that we use that bright blue um, to draw attention to it. We also removed headers from visuals wherever possible to reduce the pop-ups during navigation since we knew that was a problem and we reduced any overlapping visuals as well. Uh, we adopted our colors for colorblind folks and um, also for black and white printing, which is sometimes a need in our hospitals. Um, and the last thing we talked about was adoption. Uh, and so one thing that we did here is we, uh, we have this refreshing daily when previously um, it was refreshing weekly. So that was something that really drives people in here is to see what's happening in the current week. Thanks, those look great. And you can tell that a lot of thought was put into these reports. And so what have been some of the results of implementing this user-centric design? 
Yeah, so we have done one survey, um, so we can look at some results from that. And that was after our initial release to the higher level managers. I mentioned it was a, an opportunity for us to get some feedback uh, to improve the usability of the application. Uh, and what we heard from that was there was about 90% satisfaction with the tool. 80% uh, of users were finding efficiencies and saving time, and the majority were finding new insights. Um, we have revamped the reporting and done bigger releases since then. Um, so certainly going to do some additional surveying and um, I expect we'll see some improvements from that, which, um, which I'm looking forward to, to seeing how that plays out. And then we've also gotten a lot of like really cool anecdotal feedback um, so that it's improved people's work-life balance. So previously they were waking up early in the morning so that they could kind of collect their numbers from different places and get them into an Excel spreadsheet or something. And now they have a bit more time to sleep or spend time with their families before their morning meetings start. Um, also that it's an engagement booster to have uh, accessibility to a tool that consolidates things and enables efficiencies um, and where they can have more visibility to their peers and things like that. And it just allows for higher value management conversations with the efficiencies and additional data that we've been able to provide them. So just to wrap everything up, we wanted to close with some next steps and how we're planning to maintain user centricity in our Power BI um, adaptation. And we really, what we didn't want to have happen was a repeat of the same situation. Like Kelsey called out, we used to have just like pages and pages of Excel reports and even though Power BI makes things so much more, you know, visual and easier to look at, we still don't want to end up with this overabundance of reports that start to lose meaning and overwhelm our end users. So we got together a, um, a governance team, and it's really a team that's still pretty representative of the overall audience and the company. So we've got some power users, the managers of those analytic teams, and also um, some people from our field leadership coming together and talking about what does that standard process need to look like when we're developing reports. And really our purpose is to ensure we get that meaningful reporting to our end users while also empowering developers, report developers to embrace user centricity. So governance is not necessarily, it doesn't need to be thought of as seeking control, but actually it's more of another opportunity to, for collaboration to help other analysts in the company understand the importance of user centricity and the benefit that that will bring to their report designs. So the, the areas that we are looking at um, for you know, applying some governance are really encompass what Kelsey's already talked about. So managing that content, making sure we're not you know, replicating metrics or have you know, reports that are similar really um, paring that down so that it's meaningful to our users. Focusing on design, some of the things she called out were focusing on color usage and also like placement of buttons. And then the training, adoption is not an option. So what can we do to support our end users and that change management so that we have um, easy and clear adoption um, throughout that process? Perfect, thank you. As we wrap up, do either of you have any last comments you'd like to add? I think I've said it all. Yeah. All right, then I just want to say a huge thank you for being here today and for the time that you took to prepare your presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely.